Welcome to The Crossing Church. This is the version of The Crossing that goes where you go and delivers what you need. Fresh perspectives on faith and Jesus with practical, real-life next steps built in. This is your place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. Well, welcome to the online service. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean Kapoff, and I run a nonprofit that gives clean water to families in need all over the globe. Now, the Crossing Church are huge partners with our nonprofit and have impacted so many lives because of their generosity. In fact, to keep you up to date, the Crossing has impacted a thousand families, meaning a thousand families now have access to clean and safe drinking water in El Salvador. And that's incredible. So I just wanted to say thank you for your generosity. And honestly, the Crossing Church is just the best. Now, I get to wrap up the series you've been in this summer called Truth or Hearsay. And today I get to talk about the hearsay that many of us believe, that we deserve to be happy. But that's not really the truth. The truth is better and a little more complicated than that. Let me explain. A lot of my life right now is centered around traveling, which to some is the dream, right? I get to experience life change from clean water all around the globe. It's amazing. And on top of that, I'm a dad and my kids are incredible. My wife is a saint. Well, she kind of has to be a saint being married to me. But life, uh, even life on my social media account, it, it's one that shows that, man, what an incredible life, which it's true. It, it's really a blessing in so many ways. And I have so much to be thankful for. And yet, this past month or two, I've been anything but happy. I've just been down and out. And yet all my present circumstances would indicate that I should be happy, but honestly, I wasn't. Have you felt that way? I mean, maybe you feel that way today. It's like everything that we're pursuing just doesn't make us content. We may even have the very things that this world says will give us happiness, and yet we are left discontent. We may have the money, or we may have that power, or we, we may have that prestige, that kind of recognition, that sense of fame, or we may have the American dream unfolding before us. And yet, whether it's money, power, prestige, or even pleasure, as we pursue the things that we are told and sold that will give us happiness, we realize all of this is fleeting. A momentary, and then it's gone. And even though we know what happiness is and have experienced it, we often feel disappointed in life, thinking, I should be happy, but I'm not. Or maybe we blame our circumstances for making us unhappy. And sure, you know, being in a situation where we feel miserable, like having a job we don't like, or being in an unfulfilled relationship, or finding ourselves otherwise struggling in life can lower our happiness levels. Or we can even go on Facebook or Instagram and start comparing our life with the lives of others online, and, and we're like, man, look at them. Look at what they get to do. They seem so happy, but here I am, dissatisfied, not happy, and not content with life. Here's the thing. We all want to be happy in our life and with our life. But do we, do we deserve it? Uh, can we have it? I think so. But I think for many of us, including myself, we've been searching for it in the wrong areas. First off, we don't find happiness by directly seeking it. It's kind of like a butterfly. When you try to get it, it keeps flying away. But sometimes when you sit still, it'll land right next to you or even on your hand or shoulder. It just kind of shows up. Last month, we went to Yosemite and we were walking along the bank of the Merced River. And right there along the edge of the river, there were these butterflies just standing there. My kids bent down and were able to touch them and they didn't even fly away. It was incredible. I mean, what a gift. That never happens, but yet it did. And it wasn't planned, it just showed up. You see, we can't seek happiness, rather it's a gift that appears. In fact, what I think we're really after isn't necessarily happiness, but joy. And joy is the state of being that no matter what's happening around us, we are content, satisfied with the life that we are presently living. How though? How is that possible to be content no matter what? Especially when things don't seem to be going our way, especially when things seem to be chaotic and a mess. Well, let's look at someone in the Bible who had every reason to feel like many of us feel today. Discontent, not happy, dissatisfied and wondering what the heck is going on. And despite Paul's present circumstances, he is filled with joy rather than being crushed by all the things that are going wrong in his life. Now, Philippians 4.10 says this, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord 
that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, notice how Paul says he rejoices greatly. That word has to do with a sense of joy. It's this rejoicing that comes from within us. And as we wrestle with our daily lives and search for happiness or long to be happy, we have to realize that happiness is based upon happenstance or circumstances. But joy is not dictated by our changing circumstances. So when Paul says he rejoices greatly, it's because he has centered himself in his faith. He is rejoicing in the Lord. In other words, he has centered himself in the mystery that is God and God's greatness, beauty, goodness. He has centered himself in love which changes his vantage point as to what matters most in the midst of whatever he is presently experiencing, which is so important. Even though life is always changing, love is always there. And Paul has gone through all kinds of life changes, arrests, trials, shipwreck, pain, slander, confusion. He's even been stoned. Now, now, not the California kind of stoned, the one where rocks are thrown at you. And currently, Paul is writing this letter in prison, and yet he's still rejoicing. How? Because he knows that nothing can defeat this kind of love that he'd centered himself on. Because he knows that this love will never fail, because this love is supernatural in a sense. Whether he's in prison or not, God's love is present, active, and moving, and as a result, it transforms people. It pursues people relentlessly, and in that reality, Paul rejoices in the Lord, in God's goodness, in God's endless love. Now that kind of perspective gives us the capacity to have a right understanding of our present circumstances as we view the world around us with a lens of love. Now my kids are excellent at this. My daughter Sawyer, she sees the world through a lens of love. I mean, just the other day, a pincher bug was crawling on the floor. Her friend freaked out and said, ah, a pincher bug! kill it. To which I think for most of us, yeah, get that nasty little earwig out of here. Which is just a disgusting name to begin with, right? For a bug. Earwig? Ew, gross. Kill it. Yet for my daughter, she gets down real close to it and says, oh, hey there, little buddy. Let's get you back to where you belong. And so she takes the bug and puts it under her mommy's pillow. I'm kidding. And she puts the bug back in the bushes in the backyard. Now, how would that be? Two different ways of seeing that little earwig, right? One has the lens of disgust and fear, and the other has a lens of love. And that's what Paul is talking about here. It's in that space, as we center ourselves in love, that we begin and continue to encounter this joy, wherever we find ourselves, earwigs and all. So when it comes to our daily lives, may we see our lives through a lens of love. Now that's easier said than done. How can Paul be rejoicing in the midst of imprisonment how do, you, how do you view your life through a lens of love when you're in prison? How can he even possibly be feeling some sense of happiness while being unjustly treated as a common criminal? Honestly, how? Well, check out this next verse. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Say what? Let's read that again, this time a bit slower. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Now that's a crazy claim to make. Paul's saying he's not in need? How can he honestly say that? Well, because he's learned to be content. How though? How did he learn to be content? He didn't learn this while he was sitting at the feet of Gamil, the rabbi who taught him the Hebrew scriptures. He didn't learn this receiving one of the best educations you could could get as a Jew. He didn't learn this by being one of the best Pharisees, abiding by the law as best as one could. Rather, he learned this while following Jesus in adversity. When Paul says that he has learned to be content, this speaks of a calm acceptance of his present lot in life. To be discontent would mean that Paul wants to be somewhere else than where he is presently placed, right? To be content is to have a peaceful acceptance that wherever he is, so is God. And in that reality, it is good enough. In other words, Paul isn't living in a way that sees the grass greener on the other side. And you know how we can have that mentality, right? The grass is always greener on the other side, they say. And maybe you've probably heard people say that before. Maybe even you've said it. 
But what if instead of looking at our life as the grass is always greener on the other side, and instead we made the grass green where we're currently standing? Now, someone once said to me, the real adventure begins when everything goes wrong. And last year, I was headed back home from Honduras, ready to see my family. I had a small team with me, and we had a connecting flight. We had a short flight from Honduras to El Salvador. And while we were waiting to get on our next flight in El Salvador's airport, something wasn't right. Our departure time kept getting pushed back, one hour, two hours. And then they came out and said, sorry guys, but we can't take off today. You're gonna have to wait to leave till tomorrow night. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I just wanna go home. And so, you know, something you need to know about me is I'm not a real big fan of being inconvenienced. And immediately I thought, oh great, now what are we gonna do? And then that quote entered my brain, Sean, the real adventure begins when everything seems to go wrong. And so I thought, okay, well, we got 20 hours, we can leave the airport, we can go get a hotel, and luckily I have staff in El Salvador that provides clean water all over the country, and I also have surfboards too. And so then I thought, wait a second, Rather than just sulk, be disappointed, think about how we could be home by now and with our families, rather than think that the grass would have been greener if I would have just gone on that flight and went home, I thought, well, let's make the grass green where we're standing. So I contacted my director and told her, hey, is it possible to pick us up tomorrow morning from our hotel and take us surfing? And she's like, absolutely, let's do it. So we woke up in the morning, we went and surfed a perfect right-hand point break called Punta Roca, we then ate some amazing lunch, pupusas obviously, and then we went back to the airport, got on our flight and went home. And just like that, our trip was even better. Better than we planned, better than we could have ever imagined. And here's the deal. We can find ourselves in places in life where it's just not that great. We may get lost in it and dream that the grass may be greener on the other side. But what if we made a decision today to say, you know what? Today, I'm gonna to make the grass greener on where I stand. And that's what Paul did as a result, and that's what Paul did. And as a result for Paul, no matter where he finds himself, he has learned to be content. And sometimes the real adventure begins when everything seems to go wrong. And in that state of chaos we experience, Christ is there giving us what we need to be content. Opening up our eyes, looking out, through a lens of love and making the grass greener where we stand. Now, Paul continues to expound on this idea in verse 12. He says this, he says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, notice in verse 12, the first two words, he says, I know. Paul knows this because he's learned this. And Paul has learned this by personal experience of trusting God in hard times. He knows what it's like to be in need and to have plenty. Either reality, the source of his contentment is the same, whether in prosperity or in prison. In every situation, he has learned the secret of being content. How has he learned that secret? By being in relationship with God. Now notice verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, some people have taken this verse way out of context and have equated it to anything and everything, basically making this verse say, I can do whatever I want or whatever I think of in Christ who gives me strength, right? Especially when it comes to like prosperity or with finances or, or winning a game or people putting a sticker on their car. I can drive as fast as I want without getting a ticket because I can do all things through Christ, right? No way. That's not what Paul's saying here. What he is saying is that he has found the secret of being content. He has found the secret of being satisfied. He has found the secret of having joy. He has found the secret that no matter what state he's in, rich or poor, peaceful or in disorder, I can do all of this. I can be content in all of this through Christ who gives me strength. Paul has realized that centering his life in God has given him the satisfaction he's longed for because all that we need to be content is already within us, which is so powerful for all of us. No matter where we find ourselves, whatever cards we've been dealt with in life, take heart, trust God, center yourself in him, and he will reveal to you true contentment as you encounter his beauty and love within. 
And as a result, we can be content in life, no matter what's going on, because God is empowering us to be that non-anxious presence in the midst of chaos, because God is revealing to us the joy that is deep within us that pushes back the chaos and stabilizes us in the moment. All these things that Paul has done, we can do as well. We can live, we can thrive, we can breathe. We can experience the happiness of life because God is with you and for you and in you, empowering you to make the grass greener on which you stand. But we live in a culture that is constantly moving. We live in a society that is inundated with content and images and noise nonstop all day long, to which if I were to give up any action step for this talk, it would be to stop doing stuff. Remember, Paul's in prison. He can't really go anywhere or do much. He's just there. To which I would say, let's do the same. What? Well, well, like not go to prison, obviously, but to stop doing stuff. And what, just hear me out. What if for just a brief moment in your day, maybe the morning, which I think is best, we just stop doing stuff. Stuff like don't play Wordle yet. Don't go on social media. Put the phone aside. Just be still. Maybe go on a walk. Maybe go to a park. And just sit there and look around. Pay attention to the beauty around you. I mean, we live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Go look at that huge ocean. Put your feet in the water. Jump in. Stop doing stuff and get outside. Be in nature and just enjoy. Breathe. Maybe you need to do that right now. Just breathe. And then ask God to give you eyes to see, eyes of love. And may you encounter that richness of being content. And maybe, just maybe, that thing called joy begins to rise up within. So the action step, stop doing stuff. Go in nature, be still, and recenter yourself in love. Paul goes on to finish his letter with a doxology, which is just a way to end a letter praising God. He, he does so by talking about three things, gratitude, greetings, and grace. Look at verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I was set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Not that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the richness, riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now quick, notice that last part where he says, greet all of God's people, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Do you see what's going on there? Who are those people in Caesar's household? Well, they're people who served Caesar, right? In the royal palace in Rome. This would be people who are slaves or cooks, food tasters, musicians, custodians, builders, stablemen, accountants, soldiers, guards, judges, messages, messengers, heralds. The, those were the kinds of people that were found close to Caesar. They served his needs and kept with his business. And what Paul is saying is that many of, many of his workers have come to trust God, to be in relationship with Jesus. But wait a second, how could Paul reach such people being imprisoned? Paul's had a Praetorian guard attached to him 24 seven, which means he has a captive audience and he has seized the opportunity to share the love of God to them, to him, and God has done his thing in the guards' lives, so much so that it has gone into Caesar's household, which I just love that perspective. 
Again, no matter where Paul found himself, it's always a perfect place to show and share God's love. And the same goes for us. We want to experience happiness. We want to experience that joy that goes above our circumstances. Then may we choose to love. Where? Wherever we find ourselves. That no matter what's happening in our chaotic lives, it's the love that we receive and the love that we give that gives us the capacity to take a next step. And in that pursuit, watch and see as happiness, like a butterfly, begins to show up and joy begins to rise and our lives begin to be filled with more and more life. May we all encounter this love and may we experience the power of God giving us the capacity to be generous with the love he gives to us as we choose to love others the same. Now the hearsay we may believe is that we deserve to be happy, but the truth is is that we get to be loved and love others well with access to constant joy and contentment. And in that way of life, may we rejoice. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your constant movement in our lives, that you have never left us, will never leave us, and you're always here. And in that reality, may we be present with you. May we begin to stop doing stuff. And in in that way, may you give us a change of perspective on our current situations. Some of us are dealing with a lot. A lot is going on. We have a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And God, I ask that you would give them peace right now. May they experience your love that you have for them. And as a result, may it move within them so that they can take a next step and give them the courage. Give us the courage and the capacity to love those around us wherever we may find ourselves. Thank you, God, for moving in our lives. Thank you for this life that we get to live. May we choose to live it well and full of love. In your name, amen. Freeze be the weapon and silence is the enemy. Then freeze be the weapon and conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory Let it rise, let praise arise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall For fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side
Thanks for joining us today. I'm RJ, the student pastor here at The Crossing. These services are just the beginning. We'd love to offer you a couple next steps to help you explore your faith. The first is we have this free resource just for you. So wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, this resource is a spiritual personality test to help you find your unique path to God. It's a free gift, like I said, so just use the QR code or the link in the description to get started on it today. Then, have you ever volunteered at The Crossing or maybe you want to? Whether you are already volunteering or would like to volunteer, we'd like to invite you to our volunteer celebration on August 27th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. We're gonna have fun, eat good food, give away gifts, and really just celebrate the difference you're all making in people's lives. Plus, it's free. Um, and if you have kids, we're gonna have prehistoric pets bring all kinds of cool reptiles and animals so your kids can have a great time too. And if you're able to come, just please, if you can, RSVP on our website at thecrossing.com slash RSVP. So make sure you uh, RSVP right now so we can plan all the good gifts and food we have for that evening just for you. And if you haven't volunteered yet, or it's been a while, we definitely want you to come, but we also want you to find a place for you to volunteer here at the church. So go to thecrossing.com slash volunteer and we'll help you get connected today. And finally, to all those who give to The Crossing, we just wanna say thank you so much. We wanna let you know that people's lives are changing because of you. Your donations are creating resources and a safe place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. So truly, thank you so much. If you don't know how to give to The Crossing, go to thecrossing.com give, and you can give a one-time gift or set up a regular automatic giving and make a difference each and every month. Thank you so much again for joining us. Download that Pathways to God resource and let us know if it helps you. We can't wait to see what God does in your life too. We'll see you online all the time and on campus on Sundays at 9.15 and 11.15. See you around. Mm -hmm.